Hi, this is your host Abhilin Bharatiya and welcome to another episode of TFL Let's Talk. And today we have with us Nima Nigban, co-founder and CEO of Kinetica. Nima, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure to host you today. Uh, this is the first time you and I are talking on camera and before recording as we're talking, you know, the company has been around since 2010, as you said, which also means that not only you folks predate a lot of modern shiny technology like Kubernetes, you have seen also a lot of evolution. And today we are primarily going to talk about like generative AI. And the fact is that a lot of industries, they have been using AI already, you know, security has automotive healthcare, but generative AI has kind of opened a new kind of like floodgates. So there's so much to talk about today, but before we go there, I would love to know a bit about the company itself. What was the idea behind the company? Because you're a co-founder. So why you created the company back in 2010? And then we look at 2023, how you have seen the evolution of space and the evolution of the company itself. We started in 2010, as you mentioned, and we actually were part of a DOD research project. And that goal of the project was consume hundreds of different real-time data feeds and then be able to give a query capability to analysts, to data scientists, to developers to you know quickly be able to deploy stuff uh, into the into the field. Um, and at the time, you know, the, you know, NoSQL was all the rage. Hadoop was all the rage. There was still the, the big warehouses, the, the legacy warehouses like the Teradatas. They all really had a, a huge amount of trouble dealing with real-time data and, and being able to do complex query. They could do a few things. They could do a lot of pre-planned things where they did a lot of indexes and, and you know, supplemental data engineering to make it happen. But to be able to really find that needle in the haystack, to really be able to do whatever you want uh, across all that data as it continued to flow – there was a really, you know, no good solution. And so uh, we were there um, as uh, part of that program, and we had this idea, you know, hey, um, the, you know, the GPU is something now in 2010, even where the, you know, it, it is a tremendously powerful device. So you know, databases have been designed with one thing in mind for 40 years that compute is very, you know, scarce resource, and you know, you should be able to. Uh, you know, organize your data prior to asking your query or question so that you use as little compute as possible. Now the GPU compute is an abundant resource. So what if we flip the equation on its head? Let's make a database that's for, you know, allowing data to continuously stream in to be able to write any query you want without data engineering and leverage all of this abundant compute in a distributed way, um, in a way that allows the developers, the data scientists, the analysts to ask any question they want and get back responses quickly with up-to-date data. And that was the basic premise behind Kinetica. Um, and, and we started building, you know, in, in 2010. And, um, you know, we became the, you know, uh, analytic engine for, uh, you know, the speed layer for that program where we were sitting on top of actually, you know, a Cumulo uh, and, and t- you know, doing all the analytic uh, temporal and spatial work for, for that project. Over time, you know, we we uh, went into you know larger large enterprises like uh, USPS, which is one of our first flagship customers, um, where you know again they were um, doing something that really required a, a new type of solution. They said, "Hey, we put sensors on every mail carrier. We need to be able to analyze this in real time, and it looks like you're the right solution for that." Um, and you know that was a, one of our first major wins. And from there, we uh, really focused on becoming a um, you know, real-time speed layer uh, for the modern enterprise. So are you mostly targeting uh, the public sector, government uh, entities? No, I mean, we have we do have a, a big DOD uh, customer base, but we also have uh, financial, you know, large, uh, large banks, um, you know, large telcos. Uh, anyone who's, you know, trying to take advantage of real-time data from sensor and machine where they want to be able to do advanced analytics that, you know, potentially fuse that real-time data against you know, historical data sets to be able to query it without you know, any type of um, limitation and have it be up-to-date, have it be performant, that's really you know, our sweet spot. If you look at modern world, uh, it won't be wrong to say that we live in a data-driven world. Apps can come and go, all the technology, but data is, I mean, as we say, data is the new world, but you know, that's the real asset. Um, how have you seen the evolution of data? And when we talk about real-time data, I mean, of course, we can look at EVs, smart cars, I mean, everything, you know, we are collecting and generating a lot of data, and sometimes a lot of things have to be done in real time. So I just want to understand the evolution of real time data, but sometimes what happens is that there are a lot of technologies which continue to coexist where some technologies evolve, you know, so they transform. I just want to understand uh, the the role, importance of real time data. Real time data is, is really starting, just starting to kind of 
get its foothold in the modern enterprise. I think, you know, really it started as, you know, very simple calculations that just looked at, you know, the the latest, you know, record that would come through and have a, you know, have a very simple, you know, uh, you know, threshold based, you know, rule based, you know, uh, analysis. Um, and it's evolved to a place where it's really the, you know, the, the ability for your, your, uh, you know, your data team, your, your, your enterprise to understand what's going on in the business in real time. So to be able to query it, not, you know, not just in a window, but to query it, you know, across all of the activity that might be happening over, you know, several months or a year and be able to fuse that against other data sets. Um, that's really where real-time data is going. So it started out as something really simple, like, hey, let's look at the last five minutes of data and run these rules, right, to now where it's gone to a place where this is how we understand what's going on in our business in real time. We need to be able to query it, not just in, within the last five minutes, but within, you know, the past year or, or multiple years, have it be up to date, be able to fuse it against other data sets that may be historical or real-time, and really um, be able to be creative in what we can produce because that's going to give us that extra advantage and be able to, you know, give us that, uh, you know, that next level of efficiency that everyone's striving for. It won't be wrong to say that we live in a data-driven world. How have you seen the evolution of data, especially real-time data with the emergence of new use cases? And if you can also talk about what do you think is the role of real-time data in this modern economy? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I would say like, um, you know, as a like, if I'm looking at it by a vertical, like you know, healthcare is is one place where we're seeing you know a real explosion of uh, new ideas on how to leverage the data that they have, you know, including things like you know claims and things like that. Where um, you know traditionally that may have been just static data that was you know analyzed you know on an ad hoc basis. You're getting to a much more advanced place where people want to um, you know create you know. Uh, Huge, huge amounts of infrastructure that is analyzing that data in real time, you know, extracting value from it, extracting predictive insight from it. Um, you know, um, I think as far as like, you know, that's by vertical, but as far as like, you know, how people are, are leveraging data, you know, it's gone from a place, I think, in the Hadoop world, Hadoop era, where everyone was just like, let's just drop it in and, and collect it, right? And we'll put it all on, you know, back then HDFS and we'll figure out how we use it later. You know, I think we've gotten to a place now where, you know, there's a lot better understanding of, of the data inventory of, of a given enterprise and things like, you know, Databricks and Snowflake have done a really good job of kind of being that, you know, authoritative data store for all of the data and, and making it easy to do kind of the static or batch-like reporting and, and analysis. And, you know, I think there, there is now, you know, that next that next iteration where we fit in, where it's hey, we've, we kind of understand, you know, how our data plays together, right? But now, because we've analyzed it on, on, a, on a static basis, and now we got to put this into action where, you know, I can give my, you know, my C-suite a single pane of glass where they can understand everything that's going on in the business and not just have static KPIs that are, that are you know, uh, that are being maintained, but allow them to double click, right? And be able to ask the questions that they, that we didn't think to ask beforehand, right? You know, that's really where that ad hoc query capability, that speed layer uh, capability to do that on real time data, that's, that's where we fit in. And I think that's a lot of, you know, what we see is the evolution of the, like the database space on that kind of capability level, right? Where, you know, we've done, what we've done so far is done a great job at dealing with static problems or dealing with questions that we know people want to ask. And now it's getting to, okay, I've got something where the, the data is constantly changing and I don't necessarily know all the questions that need to be asked in the moment and I need to be able to deliver that capability. And, and that's where I think there's still space for innovation. Where else do you see the scope of real-time data beyond some of the use cases that you mentioned or some of the use cases that is <laughs> traditionally associated with? Yeah, I think there's, there's two things there. I mean, one is the expanded role of vector search and embedding generation, right? And, you know, a lot of that is best run uh, on the GPU. And that's something that we've been focusing on is, you know, making it really easy to do, you know, large-scale real-time embedding generation, doing, doing very powerful brute force GPU vector, sim vector similarity search. Um, and, you know, th that alone is something that, you know, the GPU is, you know, r really, um, you know, uh, unique in its ability to do. But then also, you know, its ability really to brute force calculate, you know, and brute force process data really fits in well with what, what, we're, what we were just talking about, which is 
with LLMs, people are going to be able to ask questions and generate code that, that you know, SQL or, or what, whatever it might be that, you know, um, you know, codifies that question and they need, they want to have an answer quickly. And you might also even have a world where LLMs are talking to each other and, you know, they need to be able to say, okay, I, I need to know, you know, how many packages are, are uh you know, available for delivery in this area, you know, whatever it might be, you're going to see that need to be able to run ad hoc query. Um, you're going to see that need explode, right? And again, the GPU is really purpose built for being able to do, you know, massive processing without having to predefine and pre-plan queries and indexes. You mentioned vector search. Can you talk about how are vector databases and knowledge graphs being used for insights on structured data versus the more common language use cases? Yeah, I mean, so like with, with knowledge graphs, you have, you know, um, the ability to find more uh, entity correlations, right? Where you have in the generative case, really in a heightened cl- entity, cl- you know, uh, entity detection and classification capability from text. Now knowledge graphs are then being used to, uh, to take whatever the user put in, tie it to what entities might match via, you know, a vector search and entities detected and then pull out new relationships, right? Um, and then, you know, again, find more vectors off those, right? So with, with knowledge graph, and vector search together, right? There's just a, um, a much more deterministic and uh, uh, powerful way to deal with you know structured data to power you know enhanced uh, LLM uh, workflows, right? So, you know, I think with generative AI and, and thinking about LLMs, you're going to get get to a place where it's you know much more advanced fixed workflows, like you know you can think of like Auto GPT, where um, there's going to be need to be able to uh, connect to and query knowledge bases, and those knowledge bases are going to be able to, you know, need to have multimodal capability, right? To be able to answer things by finding related entities via knowledge graph, or you know, to be able to pull out related uh, time series uh, data via vector search, or you know, uh, you know, there's there's going to be that need to be able to converge all these analytic disciplines. Uh, and tie it with the ability to do it quickly as the data is updating, because the LLM is going to need to, you know, have just like if you were a u- you know a user, you're going to need to be able to have the latest data and have it be you want it to perform quickly so you can take your next step. Without any contest, generative AI is the hottest topic these days. Talk about the impact it's going to have on your industry and your products. Yeah, I mean, there, there's two, two parts for us. I mean, one is powering vector search, right? And, you know, we can do, you know, vector search uh, in ways that are unique as far as giving you added flexibility um, with the result of, results of a vector search or the input to a vector search, but also being able to do that in real time. You know, so not indexing um, and being able to do it at scale uh, and leveraging the GPU. Um, that's something that's unique to us. And, you know, really, um, you know, that's something that kind of, fits into the, the generative workflows of, of today. The other, you know, the, the other big part is having a language to SQL capability baked into the product. So yes, there are other products that, you know, try to act as, you know, kind of an intelligence layer for multiple databases, but we believe that it's also incredibly powerful to have that capability in your database so that your language to SQL generates the SQL that takes advantage of all of your unique capabilities around time series, spatial, and, and graph. So we bake that into our product, right? So you can, you know, literally say like execute question, give it a natural language question and have it return SQL for you. And that and that's baked in the product, right? And that goes back to what we see as the future, um, which has been brought on by, by this generative AI revolution, which is A, user expectation that they can do ad hoc query just through natural language, right? And B, that LLMs themselves are going to be you know, you know, exchanging needs and, and queries through natural language. So having a database that has that out of the box that can bring all the different analytic capabilities to bear, we think is going to be um, a unique offering. In general, what kind of trends are you seeing, especially when we look at generative AI and what does it mean for Kinetica? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the generative space is is evolving you know, pretty rapidly. I think, you know, there's definitely pretty much um, an understanding that the vector search capability is now widely available across all databases, right? So, you know, six months ago, there was a handful of databases that had, um, you know, you know, I would say, you know, full, full-featured full vector search capability. Now, 
you know, pretty much everyone has it, right? But, um, you know, from there, you know, we're, we're also seeing the need to be able to take that next step of, okay, okay, you have vector search. Can you scale your vector search? Can you scale it with data latency? So all those are the things that are being, you know, competed for now. And, and that's, you know, where we see our, our advantages, being able to do it at scale, being able to do it as, vec, you know, new vectors are being generated in, in real time. Um, and, and then on the actual, you know, large language model side, you know, there's, I think, a, a uh, explosion of different uh, opportunities going on as far as, you know, first it, it was around, okay, we want, you know, we want to make co-pilots that, you know, help for code generation or uh, help for support, you know, but I think there's um, a lot of innovation yet to be had on how do we use generative AI and the large language model approach for enterprise and enterprise data, right? And, and that's where we're still, I think, in the early days. How to separate hype from reality? Because, I mean, I cover all these emerging latest technologies. Some technologies are just like a blip on a radar, but then many others, which transform our industry. If I ask you, when it comes to generative AI, is it a hype or is it the next uh, transformative revolutionary technology like Docker container, Kubernetes, or the Linux kernel? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a mix of both, right? Like, you know, I think when like chat GPT first came out, like people thought, oh, there's like this all-knowing, all-powerful LLM that can kind of do anything. And I think, you know, we're realizing, you know, especially as people understand LLMs more and how they work, that, you know, there's really a limit to, to how much they can do and, you know, the, you know, how you can use them to accomplish certain things, right? Now, that being said, they still are, you know, a tremendous capability that if you weave in correctly for certain tasks or, or you know, for certain, you know, really thought out workflows can, can really deliver some amazing capability, right? So... I think there's a lot of that still to be figured out of like, okay, how do we, how do we, you know, weave this in into delivering a, a still, you know, wow factor capability for an enterprise, right? But it's not quite like, oh, there's this like, you know, HAL 3000 that, you know, just I stand it up and it's going to automatically know everything about my, you know, company and, and know, you know, exactly what to, to do for all these difficult scenarios, right? It, it's, it's got its, it's definitely got its like, you know, certain uses that, you know, if, if used correctly and, and uh, orchestrated correctly can deliver still some next level, next generation capability. But, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take some time to, to, to cultivate that and, and figure that out. But it's also not just like stand this thing up and, you know, now I've got this super, super intelligent brain that can figure out anything out, right? So, you know, I think, I think anyone using ChatGPT for, for more than a, an hour or two can kind of see that, right? So, um, you know, I think it's it's definitely something that it is a, it is a little bit hype, but it's also there there is there is a there is a there there. And when we look at these emerging technologies, it's very important for organizations to while they stay on uh, trusted, reliable technologies, they should have their roots firmly planted, but they should also dip their toes in new technologies. How do you enable your customers to maintain that balance? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, one thing we really make easier is, you know, GPU adoption, GPU orchestration and, and you know, being able to take large scale enterprise data sets and bring them to the GPU in a way that that's, you know, well understood. So, um, you know, besides us also bundling our own large language model, like we make it very easy for people to, you know, do their own uh, exploration and data science in in Kinetica. Um, you know, as far as large language model fine tuning, if you really wanted, you can even do that in Kinetica, or we can host large language models. But um, you know, really, you know, what Kinetica is about is being able to take real time data and feed it to the GPU for your data science teams or your analytics teams in ways that allow them to orchestrate it very easily. So, you know, this this allows folks to who want to get their feet wet and try things out. You know. They can try it on Kinetica. At the same time, you know, there's a whole, as far as large language models, there's a whole ecosystem of, uh, you know, cloud stack, provider, cloud stack providers that are looking to, you know, roll out their own. So I think there's going to be people trying different things. Like, you know, obviously, you know, your big enterprise is not going to use, you know, the, the standard open AI large language model, but, you know, there's now an, the open AI large language model on, on Azure, right? And, 
um, you know, Bedrock is coming out for AWS. And so, you know, there's going to be, um, you know, different different products and, and different comfort levels of, of using those products. And so we're really focusing on how do we support that where, you know, we we'll, we can help support, you know, you, you know, doing large language model work by yourself or support working with other ones that uh, might be hosted. So we're really working, you know, also NVIDIA is coming out with their Nemo cloud LLM as well. Um, and we're focusing on, you know, how we interop with that. So um, we, we think there's going to be a kind of a whole wide variety of, of uh, generative LLM options. And we're looking to really support all. Like, we, we certainly don't think the answer is, hey, you know, use Kinetica, L, Kinetica for, you know, making your own LLMs and, and hosting them there. That That's not going to be the answer. The answer is going to be, you know, m- much more varied. Nima, thank you so much for taking time out today and, of course, talk about Kinetica, but also kind of, you know, broader discussions around generative AI. Thanks for all those insights, and I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me and love to be back on again. 